everybody wants to be friends with their kids and oh, they just, we just want to get along with them. But I think in a lot of ways, they're setting them up for failure. I'm okay with people making mistakes. I'm just not okay if they don't care. My big, biggest fear is being a failure. So, Kyle with a C, let's get started. Maybe for starters, let's start with some very basic questions. Where are you from? Where are you located right now? You say that's a basic question. So, uh, I, I am located right now in Salt Lake City, Utah, and that's where our headquarters of our company is as well, too, obviously. Where am I from? That's a long, that's a longer answer. I, uh, my dad was in the Marines for 24 years, so I've, I've grown up all over the world. I was born, well, almost born in Scotland, actually. Uh, that's where my family was living. I actually ended up being born in Reno, Nevada. And then we moved from there to 29 Palms, California. Then we moved from there to Oklahoma. Then from there to Chicago. Then to DC. Then to Okinawa, Japan. And then San Diego. Then Oklahoma. And then uh, and that's where I graduated from high school, was in Oklahoma. So quite a bit of moving around. In between <laughs> That's a lot there. of travel. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, I went to school out here actually in Utah to Brigham Young University. And then after my freshman year, decided that I wanted to uh, go on a church mission for our church and went down to Argentina for two years. So I was there for two years, came back. And then for work during the summers, I was out working. I worked for ADT, like the home security systems, I went out and worked in Virginia that first summer. And then the next summer was out in kind of Minneapolis, St. Paul area, the following summer. And then the third summer in between my junior and senior year, I went to, uh, I won an internship competition at the Marriott School of Business. And uh, that took me down to Southern California and worked for a commercial real estate company. So I worked there. And then I was doing Army ROTC my whole way through college. And then I went to Oklahoma for some training. So when I graduated from college, I commissioned as an officer and for my initial training went to Oklahoma. Then after that, I went to Fort Benning, Georgia and did airborne school, was jumping out of airplanes with parachutes. Then after that, I was got to my, you know, duty station is what they call it, Fort Hood, Texas, which is a little bit north of Austin, Texas. Then I went on deployment to Iraq for a year, came back home for a year, a little over a year. Went on another deployment to Iraq for a year, then came back home. And then I transitioned out of the military at that point, had done almost five years and transitioned, joined on with a Fortune 500 company out in Indianapolis, and then moved out here to Utah after a little over a year after that. So where I'm from, like I said, that is a longer story. Uh, I've lived a little bit of everywhere, it feels like, which actually I love because Rarely it feels like there's a major city that I go to, or I won't say country, but a major city that I don't go to here in the United States that I feel like I, I don't know somebody that I can call somebody up and go meet them up for lunch, dinner, a lot of times, you know, stay at their place depending on where I'm going and what's going on there. So uh, it's one thing that I've loved. Okay. So that was life of Kyle in, I don't know, three yeah. minutes. <laughs> But but let's let's try to break it down a little bit. We can walk slowly. Like to me, it was interesting already that even as a young Kyle, you were traveling a lot. Do you see that as a as a good thing, or did you ever feel as a child that I don't know, like you had friends and then you had to move away and find new friends? No. So yeah, I think everybody's different perspective. So like my wife, for example, she lived in one city and one place her whole entire life. So it's a very different, like as we, you know, mold our worlds together being married, you know, uh, we actually just this past weekend uh, on the 12th, we, or sorry, yeah, on the 12th, we celebrated our 12 year anniversary, wedding anniversary. So uh, thank you. So yeah, for me, I've always looked at it as like a big positive. I will say there's a big difference because I am a extrovert. And so I don't mind going and meeting new people. So that's completely fine with me. And that's part of the adventure and part of the fun a lot of ways. So was it hard leaving people when I was little? You know, my best friend when I was, you know, in first grade, moving from DC out to Japan. Yeah, I mean, a little bit. But at the same time, I was like, oh, I get to go make more friends. And honestly, as I matured, I always looked at it as a big benefit of like, oh, I get to go make more friends. And the really cool thing, uh, uh, I really realized that when I was in college, where 
different college, different internships, different opportunities were happening in different cities. And that's where I was like, oh, St. Louis, that'd be cool. Oh, my friend John lives there. Oh, San Diego, that'd be cool. I used to live there. Oh, LA area where I went and did an internship. That's only an hour away. And oh, I've got all these other friends that I've known that they've moved out there and they're going to school out there or whatever. So it really, I feel like worked out for my good and I'm, I'm super grateful for it. Did you ever feel that the friendships that you were building in these different places could be called a deep relationship, like a deep connection? Because right now I'm in Vancouver, Canada, and a lot of the people like immigrants who come here, they, they say that the Vancouver people are very close to foreigners and that most of their like deep connections are with people that they grew up with, that they know from high school. So like they are very nice to you, like they say the polite things, hey, how are you? They can chit chat, but there's nothing deep. Did you did you feel like you were building those deeper connections with people? Or was it just like, hey, I know John because we spent, I don't know, one year, two years together and I can call him. But would you define those relationships as deep? I would say they feel for me, they are, they are deep. I mean, obviously there's superficial relationships that you have, but I mean, for me going back particularly to my best friend in Japan, John Croshaw, he actually lives here in Utah now. We're about an hour away from each other. And at least once a year we get our families together and he's very much into football. And so we get together and do a football game. And then we're texting each other about different news that we hear about football. And actually I was just with my brother two months ago and his older brother and my brother were best friends too. And so we took a picture and we, you know, sent it over to him and he said, Oh, you know, like, it just reminds me of the good days, you know, seeing you guys together. So I truly feel like, like those are deep relationships. My best friend, uh, David Brundage, when I lived in San Diego, I mean, we still stay in contact all the time. He's a general contractor up in, uh, in Portland, Oregon now, and he was actually in town. And so we met up and grabbed lunch the last time that he was able to be in town. So I think these are very real relationships, you know, does that mean that we talk every single week or every single month? N no, you know, I, I would, I would say no know, but I think they genuinely know like anytime if they're going to be close or anything that reminds them of it, them, they, they're a text away or a quick phone call away and we can just catch up. So I think they're, they're very genuine relationships, but there are plenty of relationships that it's like, oh, I kind of know them and we live together, but we only hung out a handful of times. And yeah, am I calling or texting them if I'm ever coming to town? I, I don't know. It just depends on what's going on, you know? This may sound maybe strange to you, but are you trying to be maybe a little bit systematic about keeping in touch with people? Like, I don't know, like every month or every two months you call up someone or is it really just like randomly? Like if somebody you think about someone or something happens related to the person, you get in touch with them. Yeah, I think just for my personality and how I am, like I genuinely feel bad when I'm like, oh my gosh, did a whole year just go past by? And that was the last time I text them or the last time that we were texting. So there's definitely that. But I think that's happens to everybody. And I just try to get over it. Is it systematic? No. Oh, I, you know, do you know what? I say that. You know, it's funny, Andre. One of my goals this year is to be in better contact with more of my friends. And so actually, I have something set on my calendar on Tuesday afternoons as a reminder to call or text a friend just to reach out. So that's probably the most systematic. I do know some people that they have a whole CRM set up <laughs> and contacts in there and it tells them like who to call, when to stop. And for me, I'm like, I'm, I'm not quite there. And that's, I don't think I'll ever get there. That for me, I don't right. feel like, not to say that they're fake. I uh, appreciate that they're that organized that they want to do that. But so when I compare that to am I systematic of like a reminder on here to, you know, once a week to go, hey, you should probably reach out to some friends. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't, I don't say what friends or what family members or whatever. Sometimes it's reaching out to an uncle or a cousin and just being like, hey, how's life? What's going on? You know? And uh, so it, it's all over the board. I still think it's better than I would say most of the people. And I'm just talking based on my experience, usually maybe when it comes to work relationships, you know, when people move on from a company, they say, yeah, we'll keep in touch. But in my experience, they usually never do. But at least like if you have a reminder, maybe you're going to think of someone and then actually take some action. So I think that's pretty, pretty good. No, I think I really love and again, it's probably my wife calls me an extra extrovert, actually. Um, and so uh, and she's not even an introvert. She's probably just She's an extrovert, but not like normal extrovert. He calls me an extra extrovert because <laughs> I love connecting with people. For me, that is so fulfilling in life 
is to to connect with somebody, to understand them and they understand me and to know that they have my back and I got their back and just genuine relationships. For me, that is one of the most fulfilling things in life. I'm going to ask about that because previously I asked you about the deeper connections. And since you like connecting with people, sometimes I ask people like about their tips or I don't know, guidelines on how you can connect with someone, especially on a deeper level, if you just meet them because like i was mentioning before you know like a lot of the people that you meet sometimes strangers or i don't know if you go to conferences or i don't know sports club the first discussions are very kind of like hey how's the weather what food you like what did you watch something like that how you bring the i don't know let's say the first contact to a more deeper level like where you really feel connected to the person so probably about three four years ago i took a deep dive thinking about that quite a bit and i've changed my I feel like the way I am, do I still have superficial conversations with people? Absolutely. From time to time, like, you know, some random guy you see at the gym or something like that, like, Oh, Hey, how's it going? All good. Yeah. Everything good. Yeah. You know, it's a real quick kind of interaction, but people that are there, you know, sometimes for networking events, some things, you know, of other non-related things. If I go, I want to actually really get to know somebody. I just don't want to know something. The very first rule that I have in my mind is don't ask them what they do for work or their profession. And me, don't tell them, don't bring it up like, oh, I work in a translation company. I have a translation company. Don't bring up work because at least, and again, I'm probably going to stereotype, but for, for most men, they relate who they are as their career. And I get that that's very well tied because you spend eight hours or more or sometimes less, depending on what's going on, doing that, you know, so I totally get that. But if you really want to get to know somebody, it's not about their career because most people can talk about their professions all day long. So I try to avoid those things of talking about career. The other thing that I try to do is start asking some really deep questions, which you can't really say at the right at the beginning, but you can kind of get to know them. Oh, great. How long you've been married for? You know, how many kids you got? Oh, that's great. Hey, I've got a, a important question that I'm still trying to figure out. What would you say makes you feel alive? I love asking that question. What makes you feel alive? And you're going to hear all different answers of people. The first, I usually, if you're not a, a good example of like when you go, oh, maybe I went too deep too quickly is people will, you know, go like, oh, I don't know, you know, and they just look like shocked. Like I didn't, we were, I didn't know we were getting to that level of our conversation. Okay. But a lot of people, if you've kind of warmed things up a little bit, in my opinion mm-hmm. of like, I'm trying to figure out life. You seem like you're somebody that's got life figured out in a lot of ways, you know, that's. What, what do you do? Like, how? Do, what makes you feel alive? What are you passionate about? Things like that. You right. know? Sadly, I'd be shocked, you know, or I'm shocked when so many people bring up their profession so quickly of like, what are you passionate about? And they're like, I'm passionate about my work. And I get there's a lot of people like that, but I'm like, I know there's more to them than that. And so that's what I want to figure out. And so I ask a lot more questions about, you know, other things other than work, you know, because when it's all said and done, I, I, I like to think I don't have life figured out by any means, but I like to think, I do understand there's a lot more to life. And so when I'm sitting there on my deathbed, I'm not going to be talking about translation, no offense. You know, I'm going to be talking about most likely relationships and connections that I've had, meaningful things in life. And uh, work, I will say, you know, I'll probably think of and go, hey, that's great that I was able to, you know, build this company and the amazing people that helped, you know, helped all along the way to build that and and the sacrifices that they made and, and, you know, just the relationship, like, I, I feel like just the efforts that we had to build something together, like, I think passionately about those things. I think that's great. But it's not translation that could be in a sense, any business for that matter. Well, I might ask you that question later on, maybe. Okay. Um, All right. What makes you feel alive? But for now, I'm actually curious, because you mentioned that you went into this deep dive three years ago, what was the, the spark for that? Like, why did you even go that route? So my, my best friend, shout out Devin Peterson, uh, but uh, Devin Peterson, we, we just, uh, and I'll tell you what, like we were good friends and that's really what it was. We were good friends. And then it kind of turned into, we knew each other deeper and we started talking a little bit more about like what we're good at and what we're not good at and our fears a little bit more and being more vulnerable in that aspect, you know? 
And, uh, and then we started realizing like, man, we're really clicking. Like, this is great. Like I, I know him in a lot of ways. And he shared, he said, Hey, you, we, sh- you should read this book. I just got done with it and it's eye opening and it's called wild at heart. Okay. And, uh, basically it's written by like a, a Christian author that talks about three specific things that men need. They need a beauty to go after. They need an adventure to go on. And, and I'm blanking out on the third one right now, but anyways, he, he said, uh, so I read the book too. And I was like, man, that was really good. Like, I, I think that's right. I think that sounds right. I think most men like our DNA, that's what we want. Like, those are some of the driving forces for us. And so he, we were messaging or we actually, we were talking and he said, Hey, there's a, like a boot camp for this stuff. I said a boot camp, and he's like, "Yeah." He's like, "I looked on the back of the book, and it mentioned this, and there's a website." So I looked it up. And there's this boot camp, and so I was like, "Well, that's, that's cool." And he goes, "You'll never guess. There's one 30 minutes away from our house is here." And I was like, "Are you kidding me?" He was like, "Yeah, it's up in Wan Ship, Utah. They have them all over the United States, apparently. But there's one only 30 minutes away. I thought we were gonna have to go to like Denver, Colorado, or wherever for this." And so. Uh, I was like, well, that's that's kind of cool. And then out of the blue, he just says, hey, man, you need to get work off or you need to figure out something. Um, you're going to be gone for this Thursday and this Friday. Oh, OK. All right, man. That's cool. All right. And we showed up. He comes, picks me up. And he tells me what's going on. He's like, hey, I got our boot camp tickets. I paid for it. Don't worry about it. We're going to this thing. And I'm like, all right. So we go up there for it. They do it twice a year. And it was a total eye opening experience for me about and and it goes a little bit deeper in the book but they go to like 10 different kind of levels and i never forget i met this guy robbie who literally was just messaging with him yesterday and his him and his new wife are just celebrating their one year anniversary actually but robbie i remember sitting next to him and again these are we're all strangers besides my friend and there's probably 120 different guys there and he's and i go hey you know what what brought you up here and he goes yeah you know i read the book a while back and he goes uh uh, he says, this is like my third boot camp. And i like, third boot camp? I thought you just come once and it's like there, you know, or what he was like, oh, no, man. He's like, if you think you got stuff figured out, like you're better than I am, you know, because this is my third boot camp. And I was like, OK, well, what do you like best about it? I mean, I've been there for a day at that point. He goes, I like the vow of silence. Now, the vow of silence is they'll teach something. And then for the next 45 minutes or so, you set yourself apart. This is out in like the beautiful mountains of Utah here. And you can go out into kind of the wilderness and you got the next 45 minutes to an hour or so to think, ponder, write in a journal. It's it's time for silence, though. It's not time to like, hey, let's go talk and network and get to know other people and stuff like that. And it's time to just focus. And he says, I come up here for the Valley of Silence. And I said, and I said to him, I said, you spend X amount of dollars to come up to this boot camp to live in silence. Is that right? And he was like, yeah, that's right. And funny enough, at the end of the boot camp, and what I can say as well, too, absolutely, I pay that much to go be in silence. Like, it's a crazy thing. So when we talk about these deeper dives, that really opened me up. And actually, I have a group of friends that, again, we were all strangers. And there's a group of 10 of us that we are really close. We call ourselves the Band of Brothers now. And we're messaging each other almost on a daily basis. We're very vulnerable with each other of what we do well, what we don't do well. And it's not we rarely talk about work. We rarely talk about work, even though it does get brought up because a lot of them are entrepreneurs as well too. But it just really helped me kind of take that deeper dive to go, there's a lot more. And I thought it was so unique. They never set any game plans or game rules, but I realized with so many of them, because I genuinely wanted to get to know them as a person, I we got done and we were like swapping phone numbers and stuff like that. And and it hit me after boot camp, and we're like, hey, we should all go grab some dinner together and like just meet up. And they're like, yeah, that's great. So we meet up almost on a monthly basis to either go grab dinner or usually to do some kind of adventure. The last adventure that we did is uh, indoor rock climbing, but we do all sorts of stuff. We, we've done, we built hatchets, you know, out of metal, like we were, we were blacksmith doing it. We do all these different little ventures like every once in a while just to like, and it helps us feel alive a little bit more, you know, of, of that. But ultimately, I realized when I left boot camp three plus years ago, I'm like, I'm going to go meet up with these guys. I don't even know half of their occupations. It never got brought up. And for me, that was like the, the switch of going, okay, if I want to get to know somebody, it's not talking about work. It's going to be talking about 
deeper things, you know, and, uh, and that's what I got to talk to them a little bit about and feel like I know them all very, very well at this point. Did you think about going back to the bootcamp? Yeah. <laughs> Every six months it pops up. I'm going, Oh, can I figure out to make work and get, get out there and go do that? <laughs> Uh, Robbie still goes. In fact, Robbie has been now a guest speaker at the boot camp, which mm -hmm. is amazing. Uh, and I think he's probably now at like seven or eight times now. And he's brought his dad and brother and other people. And he's just an amazing individual. And so, yeah, I definitely want to go again. I need to look at there's just a boot camp this last month or actually two, three weeks ago, but I was away on a family vacation, so I wasn't able to make it. But yeah, definitely that boot camp is still on my list. In fact, there's a boot camp up in Alaska that me and a bunch of the band of brothers were talking about like, hey, should we go do the Alaska one? Should we figure that out and like go make that happen? I mean, it's a lot more time off work, a lot more money, but should we go do it? You know, so that's definitely under consideration. One of my ex colleague, he was very into spiritual things and he used to go to these silent retreats. I'm not sure how it's officially called. I think it's a place where you go for almost one week and you get some basic food, you get some basic clothes and you don't speak the whole time for one week. So I think what you guys had was like a smaller version of that. But what I'm wondering is, especially since you're the extra extrovert, how were you coping with the silence? Like what was going on through your head? Well, being this was, uh, I will say this was more of like a Christian based boot camp that you believe in God or at least a higher power, all different kinds of religions and faiths there, I would say. But overall, it was more that it was more of talking Bible verses were definitely uh, used quite a bit as well, too. But it was more of like, hey, if you want to be the best dad, if you want to be the best husband, and that's what kind of this book talks about a little bit. In this boot camp, there's kind of 10 sessions, I guess you could say. And so they'd go over one concept and someone would present on it and talk about that. And, you know, the people would be talking in the, in the crowd, I guess, a little bit as well, too. But then after they were done, it was like a challenge. Now I want you to go ponder, pray, journal, talk with God, go, go figure that out a little bit more of what that looks like in your life. And so over four days, you're doing these 10 different sessions, you know, and, and doing a couple of them or a few of them per day of those sessions to kind of figure that out a little bit more. So for me, it was sometimes being in my own thoughts and my own minds it isn't great because it's like I'm always staying busy with something, but it was very refreshing. And it was a time that I felt like I was probably closer to God one of the closer times that I felt like I'm closer to God and figuring out stuff, just figuring out stuff. Like it doesn't mean I have it figured out, but it's like, how does that work within me? How do I use that in my life? How do I, how does that make me a better husband? How can I implement that? A lot of different things that I wrote down and journaled and tried to figure out and feel like I'm at least one step closer to figuring out a better life. So when you are with your friends or I don't know, even with your coworkers, do you have a trouble staying I don't know, silent? Do you, do you have to be always extroverted or do you give space to other people? I, uh, well, I assume that you do. That was maybe a stupid question, but like how much do you feel inside of you? Like, hey, I want to talk now, but maybe then your brain kicks in like, hey, maybe you should just let other people talk. That's a, probably a perfect, perfect explanation for it. I think just because I, that's how I'm built or whatever, I probably always always have something to say or something to add or really I, I really enjoy asking questions and then just letting people figure it out i mean honestly if you should if start was, a podcast i know I, start, <laughs> I was about to say i would actually love to switch switch roles in that aspect because i love learning i'm i just feel like i'm genuinely interested about people you know i've i've got one employee who's very young you know i i tell him all the time i have so much to learn from him and it's not because he's got all life figured out. He's got a he's got different perspectives and different ideas. And I'm genuinely interested of like, he's got some stuff figured out that I don't. And I'd love to understand that a little bit more. So yeah, I think it's my brain that kicks in to be like, hey, stop asking questions. Hey, stop talking and let it just let things just be. Let people, because uh, if they're not an extrovert, maybe introverts more a little bit more quiet and maybe they would say something, but they want to have that break there to kind of go, oh, can I talk now? I don't want to like impose, you know, and obviously they're not going to be imposing to do that. 
Where do you think this whole thing about being extrovert or introvert comes from? Do you think it's really genes or is it how you were brought up or? Thought about that a little bit. Definitely don't have it figured out. My mom is an extrovert. My dad is actually an introvert, but he is, and I've actually read some things on that, that the, um, can't remember exactly, but, but my dad is a very, you would never guess you'd meet him and you'd think that he's an extrovert, but he's truly an introvert. He's just very good with people. So I don't know where exactly came from. I think everybody's a little bit different. I would say probably the majority actually now thinking about it. I think all my siblings, uh, I've got two older sisters and an older brother. They would all be listed as extroverts, but my older sister, actually both my sisters, they're avid readers and they love to just go sneak away and go, cool, you guys are having fun. I'm going to have fun too and go read a book. But they, at the same time, they love to come down and chat and play games or like that. So more on the side of extrovert, but you know, I don't know. I don't know if that has anything to do with it. I don't, I don't think they raised us a certain way to be extroverts, but I will go back to, you know, being in the military when you move all the time, you can be an introvert and you can, again, nothing negative on it, but you could, for me, I either saw it as I can be closed off and just go, I don't have any friends. Who's going to come talk to me. Or it's like, go out there and just go make yourself available and go make some friends because no one's going to be coming to you to figure that out. So what is actually your definition of an extrovert? Because so far to me, it sounds like very related to being good or interacting with people. But I ask a lot of people on this podcast about this and we came up with different definitions. Yeah, my definition of it, and maybe it doesn't sound like what I was explaining, but my definition of an extrovert is energized by being around other people, an introvert is energy or it is when they're around other people, it, it kind of sucks it out of them a little mm -hmm, bit. Mm -hmm. That's probably at least for me, the biggest definition of it, of what does that do? But it doesn't, but a lot of times I think people, and sometimes even generally speaking, it's like, oh, an extrovert's really good at talking to people is, is louder is whatever it is, you know? Um, I think those are characteristics, but when it comes down to it, I think that's probably the best definition I can give. What, what, yeah, what would you say? No, exactly the same one. At, at least like from what I heard other people say, like this is the definition that I would probably agree with. But then my actually follow-up question would be, especially for you, are there any people, despite the fact that you are extrovert, who actually drain your energy? Or is it always a positive one? No, 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 no. I have found this out and this is one of my, like uh, our mantra, like one of our biggest mantra is, and it's a hundred percent before someone gets hired, they need to explain this to me and they have to know this very clearly. And what I say is care like I care. You need to care about the clients. You need to care about your coworkers just as much as I do. Years ago, in, when I was still in the language translation companies, there are going to be issues with projects. And what I realized is sometimes I'd get really upset with the project manager when they screwed something up and other times I wouldn't. And I thought, well, why? Like, why am I just bipolar that I'm feeling bad that day? So I'm going to go take it out on them and go, why, what happened? Like, what'd you do? What'd you mess up? And other times I'm going, ah, man, that happens. Let's figure it out and make sure we don't have that happen again in the future. And so as I looked at it, and that's why I was able to come up with that, what I realized is I'm okay with people making mistakes. Now, obviously, we don't want them to have it be the same mistake over and over again, but I'm okay with people making mistakes because I make mistakes, you know, as well, too. What I'm not okay with is when people make mistakes and they don't care. If they're like, eh, it doesn't matter anyways. I realize that actually makes me very upset. And those are people very clearly that I do not want to work with because I know, one, it's extremely draining for me and it makes me, yeah, I just... I don't have as much patience with those individuals, but people are like, oh man, I made this mistake. This is what I did. I'm sorry about it. This is kind of my game plan. So hopefully it doesn't happen again. Can we rewrite, you know, I, I'm on the business sense. We look at, do we need to update our SOPs and our documentation, our steps, anything else that we need to improve? I love that. I have no problems when we make, you know, errors in that, in that aspect, because I, I'd love to see a company that is perfect at that or a person that is, I just don't think there is, but I'm okay with people making mistakes. I'm just not okay if they don't care. When was the last time that this happened to you? Thankfully, within Transcend, it's never happened. I, I can't express enough. I Oh, yeah, you mentioned the, the, the uh, LinkedIn post that I did, you know, just the other day, naming some of the employees that I have. Like, 
I genuinely love and just respect so much of the people that I work with because we all see eye to eye because they're the ones saying just as loudly as I am of, hey, I need you to care about this situation and this client just as much as I do or this. I need you to care. Good example, Lokesh just having this baby, you know, and having his first baby. Hey, guys, we need to pitch in together. This is teamwork time, guys. I need you to care about Lokesh and make sure that he can be with his family for the next two weeks and enjoy that time and that precious time of being a brand new dad. We need to kick it all into gear and we all understand that and that's what we're all doing and working towards. So it hasn't been at this organization. It's been several years ago and that's, again, it wasn't until actually after I left that organization and just dissecting a little bit more of like, why was I so upset sometimes with one project manager or one situation and then not on another one and then figuring that out. And that was probably about four years ago when I figured that out. We are jumping a little bit ahead because I still want to talk a little bit more about like, you know, your childhood and your teenage years. But since we're talking about this, do you have any way how you evaluate if people are going to care as much as you do when you hire them? Or how do you know? I'm going to say a little bit of luck, actually. I mean, I talk about it and I'm really clear with them on that. And I, and I say, hey, if this doesn't resound with you, if this is not like, if you want to just come to work, punch in, punch out, get your paycheck, living for the weekend kind of stuff, I just tell them, I, I just don't think this would be a good relationship. I don't think this is going to be a place that you're going to enjoy because that's not the culture here. And, and so I've had some, and I just ask them at that point, kind of in the interview of like, you tell me, does this resound with you? And most of the time, every once in a while, I'll get someone to be like, oh, yeah. And I can tell from their doubt in their voice that I'm like, hey, it's okay. Like, I don't look bad on you or like that. I just don't think it's a good fit. I don't think I'm better than you. I don't think anything like that. I just think it's not going to be a good fit. So let's save both of our times if it's not like 100% imprint in your mind. And they're like, yeah, I mean, maybe I am looking for a little bit more of like just living for the weekend or, you know, a good paycheck. And I love those people. And I always start out every single interview. I always say, Hey, just to let you know, I might be interviewing you. You're, you're interviewing me just as much or probably even more. I, what I hope is, is that we can find a good fit. If there is, then fantastic. If there isn't, let's, let's move on. That's completely fine. You know, but I said, and the only way that we can figure that out is if you're honest with me and yourself, and if I'm doing the same, if we do that, we're going to figure this thing out pretty quickly. On the other hand, if it's not a good fit, we're going to figure it out as well too, which is completely fine, but why waste both of, both of our times? And so uh, it works out pretty good in that aspect because people know, I, I feel like they let down their guard a little bit more to be them and go, yeah, that fits in line with who I am or no, that doesn't fit in line with who I am. So, and, and going back to that question of like, I, I state that very clearly of like, this is who we are. And then I say, help me understand maybe a time that you felt like that or seen that. And usually pretty quickly, they can think of a time and the times that they can't. And they're like, oh, I just, yeah, that's just where I see eye to eye. Then I can tell maybe it doesn't bug them as much or maybe they haven't figured it out. But for the most part, it's probably a decent indicator that maybe they don't feel that way all the way. So mm -hmm. I, I, I would love to, you know, honestly, spend some more time thinking and figuring out how can I do that? Because there's definitely some luck involved where I, I believe people when they're like, no, that's exactly how I feel. Yeah. I had one coworker that this happened and I was just like, why in the world aren't they caring? Like this bugged me so much. And then I went to my boss and my boss didn't really care. And I realized like, this sucks. Like how in the world, you know? And so those people I'm going, okay, we're, we're on the same, we're on the same page, you know? I want to go back still to your early years because you were moving a lot did you as a child were you aware especially like when you moved to japan like of the different culture or was it for you as a younger person that you were just i don't know hanging out with kids your age and it was the same i mean i didn't really recognize or see it i will say so one my dad being in the military for 24 years in the marines and then also me being in the military it was so interesting because I was able to look at and go, why am I the way that I am? There's so many different reasons why, how you brought up your beliefs, your parents, and all these other things. But one of the things that I always thought that was interesting in the military, which I think is pretty unique, 
is when I was in of seeing this in particular, and again, this might be controversial in a lot of ways of how people think, or I might offend them. And if that's how it is too bad, but I never really saw race. I didn't see even religions, you know, like I saw everybody as just an individual as a person. And yes, that might help me if it's like, oh, they're Jewish. So yeah, they don't do Christmas, but they do another, you know, celebration Hanukkah during that time. So I saw those different things as I grew up and I didn't really recognize it. I just knew that, oh, that's different. And that's completely fine. I didn't think it was better. I didn't think it was worse. I just saw that as different. Also being in the military, I'll say, I'll say this. When we lived in Japan, I was seven to 10 years old. And I will say, because we were military, we went to a U.S.-based school and so the far majority of people I was dealing with were still Americans, but on the weekends, me and my brother, we'd go off base and we'd go to the, all the different Japanese shops and we learned a little bit of Japanese. I mean, we were learning Japanese in school and we knew enough that we could get around and go barter and go buy candy and go on adventures and do everything else that we wanted and needed to do, which uh, I really just loved that time. But now nah, I just I just saw people as people and I just saw their cultures as being different and how unique and that's cool. And maybe there's some cool things I'd love to take from that culture and implement into my own microcultural that I have within my family, you know? Do you think it's important for, I don't know, for families or for kids to be raised this way where they're more exposed to different people, different races, different cultures? Like, do you think like maybe you would be different if you were just living in some, I don't know, small town city in the US for the majority of your life? Yeah, again, this is where I love because I don't, I don't know any different, but what I do know is my wife, good example. She grew up in a small town in an oil town here in, here in Utah, about three hours away from here. And you know, her, her dad was roughnecking on the oil field, meaning like he was working on the oil, you know, actual pumps and everything like that. And so, you know, there in that town in particular, there weren't a lot of, a, a lot of black people, you know, and realistically, I don't, again, not to get too many people upset or like that, her dad is kind of a racist, honestly, when it comes down to it. And it's not because he's naive. It's just he he doesn't know because he's he's never really been around other black people, but he's built into the, what I will call the redneck stereotype that's going, yeah, that's kind of, you're kind of the part of society that people don't really like because of, of that. And, and there's a lot of other things there. Yeah, a lot of other things there. But ultimately, do I wish everybody could do that? Yes. But realistically, is everybody going to do it? No, they won't be able to live around the world. They, you know, they got parents or a person that lives in a certain place and they're probably not going to move at least until they become adults. But I think the biggest thing for me is that people can keep their minds open because if you can do that, then you can go anywhere and be acceptable of it. In fact, I had a job offer from a, uh, another organization. And one of the reasons why is they love the idea. They're like, we could drop you in Congo or we could go drop you in Singapore, or we could go drop you in Brazil, and you would still you'd still thrive in that area. You'd figure things out and you'd go do things. And it's because I just know that, hey, yeah, other cultures are just different. They do things differently, and that's completely fine. So let me get on board and learn those things and do those things. But also ultimately I can still control the the the, the kind of culture, the kind of lifestyle that I want. And when you started having kids, did you ever think about moving like with the kids? Would you do, and I don't mean this any negatively, like would you do to your kids the same thing that your parents did to you? Or would you prefer them to be living and growing up in one place? No, no. I it, honestly, and, and by the way, sorry, Andre, are you married by the way? Or no, girlfriend? Or I'm very single, like never married. Okay, nothing, all right. No, so that that is, a, I, so my preference, I would love to live around the world. But my wife very much likes it here, which is a great thing. And I completely respect that. And and we do definitely talk about like, what if we went on an adventure for a couple months and went somewhere? Now, ultimately, there's lots of things in, in that factor. One is, you know, can your career, can your job, can, it, can you work that time off? Or can you just work somewhere else remotely? In a sense, one of the reasons why I started Transcend, I mean, very small on the bucket list, but going, hey we could actually work from wherever we needed to, you know, in that aspect, as long as we got internet, you know, we could, we could make that happen. So I would love to do that. And we've talked about that of like going elsewhere to go explore, but I will say we're not the extremist in the sense. It's like, 
let's go live here for three months and then here for three months and then here mm -hmm. and just go live all over the world. I know there's some people, you know, the four hour work week, I know really jumps on that Tim Ferriss and, and goes all over that. After reading that book and talking to my wife about it, we made the conscious decision that we like, we would like adventures and we're actually pretty regular. We just got back from a cruise over in Mexico and we, we like to go on adventures and take our kids as much as we can on those. But like, oh, you have to live in this place to get this culture. I don't believe you have to do that, but also there's so many different circumstances to say it might not be like for me, it's not the right time in our lives or it hasn't been for the past eight or nine years to go, oh, let's go do that and live all over, but very open to it for the future here. <laughs> there's a lot of discussions about that. Now, I will say it's not like we have to go live overseas, but a good example, mm -hmm. I, I went on a church mission to Argentina. In the next three years, one of our goals is to go back to Argentina, take our kids and go be there for at least two weeks. So we're hundred percent on board, haven't figured out the timeline of when all that looks like, and obviously the finances of doing that, cause it's not cheap, you know, but that's one of those things. So we want to continue to take our, our kids on adventure and who knows, maybe after we go there, my wife goes, what if we lived here for like a six months a year? What if, what if we did that? Like, you know, there's all sorts of things, but one of the things we would like to move eventually at some point we've talked about texas we loved living in texas and then also there's a place in southern utah that is gorgeous that is a real possibility too but it's still all things to get figured out is there any like a personal favorite place for you on your bucket list that you haven't been to to live or to visit like vacation i guess both to vacation i can talk towards that actually my wife and i's 10 year anniversary two years ago we had and we still have the money saved up for bora bora to go to bora bora it was it's been on our bucket list and so i'm happy to say next year we're finally going to go and make it happen and and to do that we were supposed to go for our 10 year wedding anniversary COVID obviously hit everything got screwed up with that so so bora bora is a bucket list place that we'd love to go another bucket list is for me is to take take my family down to go meet the wonderful people that I know down in Argentina and to be able to go break bread with them and have dinner and have them live, see their culture and visit and see the scenes that I, that I had. Now I get, they're going to be more nostalgic for me, but I think my wife and my kids will very much look forward to it and think about it all the time. Other than that, my, my daughter, she's eight years old. She loves pina colada. So anytime we can get down to Mexico and get a good pina colada down there, we are all about that and they love it and they think it's the coolest thing that dad can just talk to the, all those people, even though they don't understand what they're saying because they're in Spanish, you know? And so that, and one of the cool things is, is our kids are in a French immersion program at school, at least the two, two older ones are. And so uh, one of the things that we'd like to do as well is go over to France. They're not fluent, mm -hmm. but their, their French is very good that they could get around and where's the bathroom and oh, the bus and all the other kind of common terms that you're like, oh, they can get us around. And I don't speak French, you know? And so <laughs> I, I, that's a one that we're actually li really looking forward to in the next couple of years as well, too. I see you're diversifying the language knowledge among your family. So wh why did you send them to, to learn French? Well, honestly, what ha we happen to live about three blocks away from the elementary school and it is a French immersion program there. And so, you know, I said, how can we get in into that? I'm all about it. Even though I would have loved Spanish because then I could speak with my kids in Spanish. But at the same time, I look at it as a huge benefit because French is obviously another major language and I'm going, helps me understand things more as well, too. I think I asked so many questions so far that I didn't even prepare because I'm just curious <laughs> about what you're saying, but I think that's good. So one, one important question that I have is when you were younger, let's say, I don't know, a teenager, what, what, what did you think that you were going to be as an adult, like for a profession, if you remember? Probably the closest that I could get to is I thought I was going to be working at the New York Stock Exchange. I was a little bit, I wouldn't say an odd duck, but one thing that I realized when I was eight, eight years old, I started tracking mutual funds when we were eight years old. And the way that I did that is every Sunday we would get the paper. And uh, one day I was looking at it and I saw all this super small fine print. It was the tickers for all these different stocks and mutual funds. Okay. And it took up literally a whole entire page and it just looked like garbly goop to anybody else. And I remember looking at him like, dad, what is this? And my dad's like, oh, those are 
stocks and mutual funds. And I'm like, okay, what is that? And he's like, oh, well, you know, explain. These are stocks. This is what the company owns, you know, and this is how much their a, a share of their company is. And he explained that all to me. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. My dad was in the military. It's not like he was some stock expert, but he put money away and would save, you know, I almost every single month, you know, and put money into savings and, and, and stocks and invest. And, he, and he, I remember him saying, well, this is the one that me and your mom, this is what we put our money into right here as a Vanguard one. I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> So I started like, I'd keep and I and I asked him, I said, Hey, can I keep this paper? And he was like, Yeah, sure, I'm gonna throw it away anyways. And so over weeks and months, and actually, I would love to find it because it's very clear in my mind. I mean, I would have a running, I'd keep that page every single week. And I'd highlight in green if that stock if the price actually would go up. Yellow, it was pretty much about the same. And then red mean that that stock was going down. So I started manually tracking again, this is in the 1980s, okay, manually tracking what stocks were going up and what stocks were going down. And then I would tell my mom and dad about them and say, like, look at look at this one has a trend, it's going up and it's going well, you know, and I'm sure you could, I mean, the internet's not really the internet's not, not around at that point. But I was like the manual person. And I thought, you know, this is so cool. When I was in college, it really came that when I when I left high school and graduated from high school, it really came down. To, I said, you know, hey, want to go to school. And that's like the hint of like, mom and dad, are you helping me out with this? Because I got other friends that their parents are paying for them to go to college, you know, and it was like, Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll help you out. You need to go figure out financially. And so scholarships, unless you want to go work your butt off and try to save that money. And I'm like, Oh, okay, so I opening that sense. So I started like figuring out and going to apply for scholarships. And that's when my dad said, Hey, did you know, there's these ROTC scholarships, like for the army and the Marines and the Navy? I said, okay. And he goes, yeah, I mean, that's kind of a, a way to pay for school. And, you know, I happen to be a colonel in the, in the Marines, so I could probably write a decent letter of recommendation and, and have some you know, other people kind of write some letter recommendations, some generals and stuff like that, that uh, we knew and were neighbors. And so I did that due to my good, good grades, you know, being, uh, you know, a uh, captain in two sports and, and uh, just kind of the service that I did and stuff like that was able to get a full Army ROTC scholarship and a Marine Corps ROTC scholarship. I ended up choosing the Army one just due to the school that I was going to and stuff like that. But when I went to school, I I thought, hey, and just talked to my dad. He was like, hey, at that point, he had retired from the military and started working for Boeing. And he's like, look, and I said, hey, I want to go make money. I don't want to be broke. You know, we we were very middle income, probably middle lower income kind of stuff. And I thought, mm-hmm. you know, and, and how I was raised is my parents were like, oh, cool. You want to go buy that? Go figure out, go get a job, go do something, you know? And one of the things that I say is my parents gave me everything because they gave me nothing. And I mean that in the financial sense. Now I would be very disheartened. Like, it's not like they completely gave me nothing, nothing ever. Like, you know, when school season came around, like we'd go shopping and I'd get, you know, a couple new pairs of shirts and some jeans and some shoes. And, oh, you want more than that? You want two pairs of shoes? Okay, you got to go pay for that. But so it's not like I'm ungrateful and they know that they I'm so grateful because they put a very I learned work ethic because I had to go learn work ethic. But ultimately, I asked my dad, hey, what could I what should I major in? What should I go figure out and go do? I don't want to be broke, though. And he's like, well the people that make really good money that I know are, they're all electrical engineers. He's working at Boeing, you know? And so I'm like, Oh, okay. Electrical engineer went and did that. Started taking all the prereqs, electrical engineering and all the chemistry and all the calculus and stuff like that. I'm like, this is hard. Electrical engineering is hard. And I realized, man, there's a lot more, again, no offense, a lot more nerds around here. And I don't think I really fit in with this. Like this is, this is really hard for me and this seems easier for them. And, and so I shifted gears and got into business is what the route I started going down. But what I, even when I was in school and the Marriott school of business is a pretty, it's a top 10 business school in the country. And that's what I graduated from. But I did, uh, there was an investment bank, uh, banking club and I was some part of that. So I went out to uh, New York and uh, with some other people, we had about 10 of us. There's a lot more in the club, but this was kind of like the, I don't know, the, the people really, really interested, really trying to go down that path. And investment banking is not easy to get into, but we got wined and dined by Goldman Sachs and Credit Suisse and, and uh, JP Morgan and 
Lehman Brothers. I'll remember Lehman mm-hmm. Brothers. They're no back longer then. around, uh, but <laughs> yes. Lehman Brothers, this was back in 2007. And uh, so anyways, got to do that. And for me, it was at that point that I figured out, I was like, I don't want to do investment banking. These people are working at minimum, at minimum 60 hours a week. And a lot of them were working upwards of like a hundred hours a week. And it was just crazy. And I was like, wow, like you got to be all in to do that. And I realized that's probably not what I want, work-life balance and stuff like that. So that's what shifted my focus from thinking that, hey, I'm going to go work at the New York Stock Exchange or go do, you know, banking or something like that and realizing that wasn't quite for me, you know? And again, when it comes to banking, there's all sorts of stuff. There's banking, like normal banking hours. I'm always jealous. I'm like, you get Columbus Day off? You get random (laughs) banking holidays that I'm like, man, that's nice, man. They get a lot of days off. You got, what, 25 holidays that you have in a year? That's great. So, yeah. One thing that I'm curious, and you were talking about this uh, when you were answering the question in the earlier times, you said about the work ethic. And I kind of like agree with that. My question was, is this something that you're trying to teach your kids or are you more generous with them? I'm, I'm definitely more on the work ethic side. That's what um, I very firmly believe God's got a lot more figured out than I do and than anybody else for that matter. And that's why I think he's big on, you know, that marriage is a good thing. My wife brings certain personalities, aspects. She's more of a nurturer. On the other side, I'm the more disciplinary kind of person. And if we just raised our kids separately, obviously there there could be some good things with that. But overall, I think that was not the best way. Like they get the get the nurturing and the compassion a little bit more from my wife. And and not that I'm not nurturing or compassion from time to time, but I'm more the disciplinary like, okay, great. They're like, hey dad, I want this at the store. I'm like, awesome, cool. Do you have any money on you? <laughs> no. I'm like, well, that's going to be hard. You go talk to the cash register and see if you can just take it home. And they've learned that lesson where they like go and they're like, can I have this? And they're like, okay, that's uh, $3. Do you have $3? And they're like, no. And they're like, sorry, you can't, you know? And so just little lessons like that, that I enjoy doing that. And my daughter in particular, she's always figuring out ways to, to make money and to do that, which is great. You know, and my other son, he's, he's figured out, you know, bake sales and and trading pokemon cards and selling his pokemon cards and all sorts of other things so i enjoy that are they the most like entrepreneur kids ever you know no no uh i think there's a lot of parents that really focus and really do that which is great but at the same time i want my kids to try to enjoy a little bit of life and be a kid but yeah there's some life lessons that they need to learn and they'll learn them along the way i mean they're still a long ways. My hope is when they leave and they graduate from high school and start heading off to college, or I'm not even against if they go to a, you know, a technical school to be a plumber or electrician or whatever else that they might want to be. But at that point, they're going to go, okay, I got stay out of debt, you know, work hard, go figure it out, you know, be resourceful, you know, ask for help when you need help, stuff like that. I hope they have that pretty well figured out. And I think they're on a great trajectory right now for that. This may be a weird question coming from someone, like I told you, is not married, no kids. But did you ever think about maybe even in the earlier days that your approach of being, let's say, the bad cop would make the kids love you less, especially when they're younger? Yeah, I mean, being the bad cop's never fun, honestly. (laughs) It stinks. And my wife and I, we talk about that. I'm like, hey, could you help out and be the bad cop every once in a while? Like, yeah, that'd be really nice because, you know, I don't want to be the bad cop all the time. In fact, you know, being the youngest in my family where I grew up, you know, I'm with my older sisters and having, you know, I'm the uncle. I'm I'm the fun, cool uncle. Like I come around, you know, especially before I was married. Yeah, let's go spend. Let's go do this. Let's go take them out. Let's go do all this stuff. And I spoil them and have a good time with them. And they're like, man, that's awesome. Now that I got my kids, like my kids don't believe my nieces and nephews now who are, you know, you know, not all of them completely grown, but, you know, they're teenagers, if not, you know, graduated and in college or whatever now they're like what you thought my dad was cool like what's the what's the deal you know <laughs> so i think there is a, again i think there's a good balance there my brother actually had a uh now an ex-wife that she had a very different perspective on thing she wanted to be her kids best friends and i would say that i strongly don't agree with that perspective I think parents need to be parents and they need to help kid, set their kids. And that means loving them as well too. But being just their friend is not 
again, in my opinion, it's just, it's not the way to go about things because they need a parent. They don't need a friend. They get, they're going to have lots of friends in life and they're going to get that. A parent is something very unique and a parent needs to be a parent. And that's something that I feel like the world is changing quite a bit on. Everybody wants to be friends with their kids. and Oh, they just want to get along with them. But I think in a lot of ways, they're setting them up for failure. And I think in the long run, they'll probably go, man, I, I should have told them that. I should have stood up and said, no, I'm your, I'm your parent. And this is sadly, this is the rules. And this is what we're going to have to do. Not, well, you can do whatever you want, but that's not what I would want to do. Like, I'm your, I'm your friend. I'm your buddy. But I'll, I'll support you in whatever you want. Like, sometimes I think you just got to lay down the rules and go, sorry, not possible. Well, thank you for being open about this, because I guess it's not the, the most positive answer that maybe some people would want to hear, but I, I appreciate it. And it's just my thinking and my philosophy on things, you know, uh, like I said, I don't have it all figured out. So I'm sure some people will be like, he's dead wrong. And that's, that's okay. They can have their opinion and I have my opinion, you know. So I'm now going to ask about the army thing. Because I didn't know about that until today when I finally went to your LinkedIn profile. I was like, like what? <laughs> US Army? So now that you're talking about your dad, it kind of like makes more sense. But I'm still curious, what was the primary reason why you joined an army? Like, why does a young person join an army? And maybe to give you my context is, I think I mentioned to you that I'm from Slovakia. And when I was a teenager, the like like going to the army, I'm not sure what is the English term for that, like used to be mandatory. Like every every guy had to do that. I was so afraid of it. And then fortunately they canceled it. So it was only like a professional army since then. So I didn't have to do that. But I would be so afraid to do that. And it looks like, from what I understand, that you did it voluntarily. So why does a young person do that so the 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 real reason why i was interested at first is because i go oh man i need to pay my way through school where can i go get a scholarship or money or something like that and honestly that was it that i realized like okay we can do that there and that was because my dad said hey by the way and again i'm figuring things out i'm 15 16 years old you know at that point almost 17 years old and i'm like oh okay well that's a scholarship potentially. So let's apply and go do that. My story of why I actually went through with everything is a different story though. So I, I showed up, I went and looked at different schools, got accepted at different universities and then decided to go to Brigham Young University out here in Utah from Oklahoma, moved out to Utah. Just felt like it was the right thing. They had army ROTC, they did not have Marines. And so that's the reason why I chose to do the army instead of the Marines is because they had the ROTC program there. Now, the RTC program is you're going to school, but you also part of your schooling is you is that you take military science classes. You understand, you know, the art of war, you understand tactics and procedures and why the military does certain things and how to dress and you get uniforms and stuff like that as well too. So it's kind of like baby stepping into the military without having to go to like a boot camp in a sense to just get thrown into the blender and go, "Oh man." And two, uh, ROTC, there's two different aspects of the military. There's what they call enlisted. These are people that just go directly into the military. And those are those people that go to boot camp. And then there's officers. Officers, you're required to have a four-year degree. And so, and then you go through this training as well too. Officers typically lead the, the enlisted soldiers in a sense. And so they're kind of making more, taking or uh, giving more of the orders and things like that. It's a very, very interesting like cultural world that you look at because a lot of people go, well, the officers are like the C-level sweet people, you know, like they're the bosses, they're in charge, they can do whatever they want. And everybody else is just the employees, you know, but you see like how well they work together, how much the respect there is and how much that a good leader will listen to employees all day long, in my opinion. And where you see that in the military and where you drastically see that doesn't happen sometimes in the military as well. But ultimately, I decided on the Army, went down that route. After my freshman year of college, I had a four-year degree or a four, sorry, a four-year scholarship. So my first year, the military paid for my first year of college. And what I mean, they paid, they paid for my tuition and then they paid me for a little bit of, of a stipend for room and board. And for books and things like that. So it paid for a pretty good chunk of it, but not all of my my uh, my college. So after my freshman year, I had, um, I guess you could say a spiritual awakening. 
And that's where I felt very compelled that I wanted to go share my testimony about Jesus Christ. And so how you do that within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is the, the religion that I'm part of, is then you, you, you express that and then you put in your paperwork to say, yes, I would like to go on a mission to, to do that. And you don't get any say or any pick. I lived in Japan when I was uh, little for three years, you know, knew Japanese better than any other language. In fact, I took high school Spanish and was horrible at it, the worst grades that I ever got in high school. And for whatever reason, was asked to go down to Argentina and to work with people there for two years in Spanish. And I thought, hilarious. I don't speak Spanish, but I'll figure it out, you know. And uh, learning Spanish was much harder for me compared to learning Japanese. But anyways, eventually it took time and finally did that. It was while I was there, and I have a very specific story of what happened when I was there in Argentina. I had been there for about a year was talking with a family. They actually got deported from the United States back to Argentina. They were in Miami. They got caught. They they were illegal aliens, got caught and got deported back to Argentina. Argentina is a little bit different too, because their laws, and I don't know if they're still the same, but 20 plus years ago when I was there, you could go and you could squat at a home and be at a home. And after six months, if no one is there, that technically is their home and you can't kick them out even though you might own the property. Kind of odd in that sense. So you see a lot of people when they go on vacations or whatever, they truly have like a security guard or so a house sitter that comes and stays at the house. But the long story with that is they were actually at a very nice house and that's how we met them. They said, come on over. And so we came over. We thought it was really odd. I say nice house, but nice in Argentina for the most part. That was really odd that I thought, why are they cooking under this stove, you know, kind of thing. And what I found out is they didn't have any power or uh, any electricity or any gas going to their home because they didn't own the home. They were just squatting at that house. Didn't find that out until later. So they're cooking at the stove and the husband, they've got two different kids and he's just complaining like, this is complete crap. Like we came from in Florida, we had like our playstations and we were, had, life was so good. And, you know, and we, we had so much more money and stuff like that. And now we're here back in Argentina. And he was very vitriol about it, that he was just like, this is such a crappy country. And oh man, I, I'm like, we look at, we're cooking our, our food in a wood stove. Like this is ridiculous, you know? And he was so like upset with it. And it was at that point that it really clicked of like how blessed that I am to be born in the United States, be a citizen of the United States, and truly the opportunities that we have there and so many things that we're blessed with, both financially and economically and freedoms that we're blessed with, that it hit me right then about a year into living in Argentina that, man, we are blessed. And if there's something that I could do to help our country be in the same situation, I feel obligated to do something like that. So Fast forward a year later, after I got home from my mission, two years and being in Argentina, got back and now I was going back to school to go to my sophomore year of, of college. And literally when I hit the ground in Dallas, that's where our airport landed. And I got to the literally the physical ground. Uh, I had to go across a terminal, terminal and it was on cement, but I literally like kissed the ground. And it's not because Argentina is bad. I can't wait to go back there. It's just, it, I have realized how much I appreciate and how lucky I was, you know, there's mil- billions of people in the world and the luck that we, I have to be here to have the opportunities they have is very lucky. So anyways, I made that decision, came back and my four year scholarship allowed me to get the first year, my freshman year completely free with no obligation. And then I had to make that decision my sophomore year once I got back. And so they said, Hey, are you doing this? Cause if you do, and you sign on the dotted line, you start taking government money to pay for your education, you're, you're, you're owe it. And I said, absolutely. I'm hundred percent in. And then from that, I owed four years back of active duty military time. And, and so I actually ended up doing a little over that five years or so due to going to on deployments and just wanting to make sure I fulfilled all my obligations. And then, and two, I didn't know if I was going to make it a career and be there for 20 plus years, or if I thought, Hey, maybe I'm just going to do four years and get out. I didn't know, but after you know four plus years in, that's when I made the decision. Specifically, my wife and I made the decision that hey, we're going to transition from the military. Being home a year, then gone a year, home a year, gone a year in the war countries just didn't seem like long term what we wanted. And there's a lot of other things there too, you know. But yeah, 
I pretty much know, or I can assume what your answer to this question will be, but I'm still going to ask, were you afraid of dying? Like, was that ever on your mind or was like the higher purpose of what you can do for the country, like more important to you? Well, Andre, you, you tell me, let's go with your assumption real quick and just hear that. Well, my assumption would be that, yes, I, to me, like, it's like, I don't know, every, but maybe it's just, I'm basing it based on how I would feel in that situation. And I would be very, very scared for my life. That's why I didn't even want to go to that thing that I mentioned to you before. But I don't know, maybe for you, it was completely different. Like maybe you saw the purpose as the most important thing and you didn't even think about your own life. I don't know. But you also mentioned your wife. So it's not like you, you were just on your own, right? Yeah. So I you know, I finished up school, commissioned as an officer, did training, got duty station, went on my first deployment. It was after my first deployment. That's actually when I found my wife and we started dating. And then we got engaged and we got married. I say pretty quickly. It was with, within a five month period. So for some people, that's really fast. For other people, they go, oh, that's normal, you know, kind of thing. Everybody's a little bit different. It felt very fast, particularly for me. But the only way that I could describe it to my friends, they're like, wow, you're getting married that fast? Like, do you even know her? You know? And uh, the biggest way that my wife and I could describe it to each other is, when you know, you know. So why wait three years or five years or however long, you know, some people deem as enough time to actually know somebody. We just knew. We just knew that we wanted to be together and we knew that we would figure it out and there would be lots of surprises along the way and that's okay. You know, that's what life and that's what marriage kind of looks like. So for me, did I think about dying? Not really. I was into a little bit more of the cause and the purpose and it, it, and two, I will say on the spiritual front, like I very much believe there is a life after this and not that I'm like, got it all figured out and I'm going to go to heaven and all that other stuff. I hope that, I hope that's the case, but I'd really don't fear that. I really, I, I, yeah, I just don't really worry about dying. You, my wife, she's a little bit more on the other side where she's a little bit more going, man, dying is a scary thing for me. I don't think it's a scary thing. Honestly, I think it's just a transition. Maybe I look at it very similar to when we moved from Japan to San Diego, you know, like it's just part of a transition. It's just what it is. And I genuinely believe the people that we know here and the relationships that we, we make here that we'll be able to have those, but even more on a higher elevated level after this life. So I don't mind dying. Like, do I want to leave my wife and kids for that? No. But at the same time, I definitely don't live my life. I would say in fear, definitely in Iraq. I mean, during my first deployment, I, I got a bronze star for for some of the, uh, well, for one per particular mission. And uh, there was times I definitely put myself in harm's way to help my men and to make sure that they came back safely and alive. That was my, I wasn't worried about dying. I was more worried of having to go back to the soldiers that I was over and that they reported to me. And having go, to go back to their spouses and their families, because in the military, you get to know them, you know, um, you see them at balls, you see them at different functions that we hold. And I didn't promise them, but I remember just thinking wholeheartedly, like, I will make sure your husband comes back. Like, I will make sure. And that's probably if I, if I had to say what was the proudest part of my military career, it was going, taking soldiers over to war, doing the missions that we did and successfully doing it. But more importantly, bringing them all home without thankfully any serious harm or accident to them, uh, which I feel very lucky for. So, so no, I didn't worry about that stuff. I will say on the other side, it depends on how you're raised. Again, I, my dad, he went to the Gulf war, you know, he was a Colonel when he went and did that. I was eight, eight, eight and nine years old when that happened. So I really wasn't too, I guess, Growing up in the military, it's not like it makes you not afraid, but I just knew that my dad described it the best way. I'll say this much. You do so much training. I think it's really easy to go, oh, go to war or whatever. My dad went through almost his whole career. He went through almost 16 years. It was training and training and training, but there was never any war that he went to. He missed the Vietnam War just barely. And so it's just training and training and training. And so when it was time to go to war, He's like, coach, put me in. We're ready. Like, you know, why would you, it's like an NFL, you know, professional football player. They're training all the time, but to never actually play in a game, like who would want to do that? No, go use your skills. Go, go, go do something. Even though yes, life and death is on the line in that aspect. 
when my wife and I got married, we got married. And then six weeks later, I deployed on my second deployment. And one of the things that we made a conscious decision and what I really recommended to my wife is true. We just barely got married, but she could stay in Utah where she had been, you know, and stay close to family and have other support systems there. Or she could move out to Texas where she really didn't know anybody, but there's also the support system of other soldiers, wives, and things like that as well there too. And so my very strong recommendation is that she move out to Texas and she lives there because that's where now our home is going to be. And even more is it's a very different front if you're not familiar with the military. If you're, you know, we're in Utah right now and other places that aren't familiar with the military, you know, and I say familiar that they're, it's not like everybody around them is in the military. And it's easy to, especially at that time, to look on the news and go, wow, you know, almost daily you're hearing of an explosion, somebody died, seriously injured, whatever it might be. And that, that's got to be, it was harder on my wife than it was on me on my deployment because she had the what if, what's going on, I don't know what's going on all the way. And so being around other military people and those spouses, yeah, th- there was that thought still in the back of their minds, but they thought, we're here. I know what's going on. Oh, I, I heard from so-and-so's wife, like, oh, they're, they're doing okay. And I think a lot of times too, Hollywood beefs this up as that, like, you're in a war-torn area, you're shooting at each other all the time, and that's happening all the time. I would say, and this is just my circumstance, but I would say this would probably be across the board. 90% of it is not exciting Hollywood times. Bullets aren't flying past you. But for the other 10%, yeah, it's suspenseful. There's bullets, there's bombs going off, there's other things. Um, and there's that chance of you dying. But for the other 90% of the time, sometimes it's sleeping, sometimes it's getting on the internet, or at least thankfully we had an internet, you know, and like, you know, getting some emails done and I don't know, just normal work stuff, especially in my world as an officer, writing reports and other just stuff that is like not sexy, not cool. You don't see this in Hollywood or on the movies. Uh, and then the other 10%, yeah, we were on missions. We were in the in the fight, you know, of, of uh, you know, potentially getting killed. And ideally, the biggest thing is hunting down bad guys and capturing or, or killing them if we had to at times. So if you are not afraid of death, what is it that you are afraid of? For me, I think kind of a different, couple different things. I would say my big, biggest fear is being a failure. And that can be on probably multiple fronts. But the first one that comes to mind is being a failure to my wife and to my kids. I look at it and my, my wife and I have a very good understanding. She is a full-time mom. She is not in a career other than being a full-time mom, which is a full-time job in so many different ways. I am, I am a, a provider. I need to make financial gains for our family to be able to live the lifestyle that we live and to have the things that we have. So we have certain roles and we understand that. And some families, maybe it's the wife that does that and the husband's a stay-at-home dad. But uh, for me, being a failure and not being able to provide for my family, and it doesn't mean that we need to be rich, but not being able to provide and go pay the mortgage and have food on the counter. And so there's that side. Also, being a failure and not teaching my kids the life lessons that they need to be eventually, you know, when they turn 18 or when they graduate from high school to go off to college that they're going, I don't know how to do my own laundry. No, our our 10-year-old kid, he knows how to do his own laundry. And our eight-year-old, she knows how to fold her own laundry but she doesn't start it up and put all the soap in and do all that other stuff yet. But as long as I know that they're making those progressions, that's very important to me. So I don't want to fail in those two aspects. The next failure that I look at, and I kind of talk about this life, life has three different balls. It has a, a, a wooden ball, a glass ball and a rubber ball. And I'm juggling those things all the time. And I think this is across the board for everybody. Everybody's juggling those things. Okay. The rubber ball for me signif- uh, uh, signifies work, okay? You don't want it to fall, but guess what? If it falls, it's going to bounce back up. Whether you quit your job or get fired, you're probably going to go find another job and you're going to have a job most likely. It might not be the one that you want, but it's a rubber ball and it's going to bounce back. So for me, if I have to drop one, it'll most likely be in the work front. The next one is the wooden ball. The wooden ball for me is... Um, is, is basically my family and my kids and, or sorry, the wooden ball is my, is my friends. Okay. Those are the ones, again, we talked about like, Hey, you systematic and doing that. Like, no, I want to stay in touch with them though. And I want to let them know that I'm, I'm going to be there for them if they really need something. 
And that one can get dropped from time to time. Sometimes, you know, we got these get together and it's like, man, I already have something else planned. Sorry, I won't be able to make it this month or this time or whatever, you know, that one can get dropped from time to time. But if you drop it too many times, eventually it gets enough nicks or it can crack and it can break, you know? And then my third one, which is that glass ball, that's my family. That's my, my wife and my kids. Okay. If I drop that one, I mean, yeah, it can take a little bit of scratch here and there, but it, for me, you can't break, like you can't let that drop too many times because then it eventually it won't be there anymore. It will be broken and that one can take a lot less drop. So I'm always juggling those things and that's how I kind of put in priority of, of that. So when I talk about what am I scared of, it's being a failure and probably in that reverse order. I can't be a failure to my wife and my kids. I can't be a failure to my friends, you know, to be there for them if, if they really need it. And then I can't be a failure to my work. You know, I don't really care too much about all the accolades. Like I can say that. I mean, yeah, it's really nice to have accolades and be like, oh, I'm successful doing this and that. You know, I mentioned, you know, being in the military, having a bronze star. Actually, I have two bronze stars, but those are nice. Those are great awards. And like, am I not proud of them? No, I'm definitely proud of them. But at the same time, if I drop that and I don't have that, that's okay. I, I have those other things. And so hopefully that makes sense of like, what am I scared of? It's, it's failure and, and failure to myself too, like more than anything else of, I, I think highly myself, like I want to go achieve things and go do things and, and taking that pride in myself to say like, I can go do that and me not making, you know, doing that. That's the worst fear that I have that I don't just don't show up in the way that I know I could show up. Usually people who are afraid of failure, especially for themselves, tend to be perfectionists. Is that something you see yourself as or not really? Uh, no, I, I definitely would say, yeah, I'm uh, probably a little bit more on the perfectionist side. My wife does a good job of reminding me that it's okay. Not, it's not perfect. Guess what? House is messy. That's okay. Like, it's okay. The house can get messy and it can be that way even for a couple of days and no one dies and it's all okay. And so... Again, that's the, for me, the benefit of, of having a marriage and a partner that can, uh, you know, this might sound very cliche, but I truly believe my wife completes me, like makes me whole. And it's because I'm missing certain gaps in my personality and who I am that she can literally fill in and she can help teach me and learn those things. And so us together, it doesn't mean that we're like perfect, but we can become that way. If we work together, if I listen to her and fill in those gaps and when she needs helps and support and things that she's not good at, like budgeting and, and dollars and money and numbers and stuff like that, I'm, I'm more of that person, but she's so much better of going, Hey, you know, just the nurturer and just seeing some things and going, Hey, did you think about maybe how you said that to somebody that maybe it wasn't the best way? Oh man, I didn't realize that. Thanks for bringing that to my attention. You know, those are all, all good things. So, but yeah, I would say definitely I have a little bit more of a perfectionist kind of mentality. Okay. I was curious about this, even though it's maybe not so related. When you mentioned that when, when you met your wife, that you knew very soon that she was the one, was this like the complimenting thing, one of the things that made you feel like she's the one? And, and part of my question is like, I was curious whether, whether you can imagine that you would be in a similar, I guess, happy and fruitful relationship with someone who would be more like you, or you don't see that happening. So I don't think I saw that completely at first. I don't think anybody does. Cause, and I think that's why a lot of people wait a long time to get married because they want to like figure that out. And only time can tell you, it takes a long time to get to really truly know somebody. What I recognize is one, I thought she was beautiful. Okay. That's, I don't know about everybody else, but maybe some people don't even look at looks, but I thought she was gorgeous. And I thought, cool. <laughs> Check. We got that checkbox. That's great. She's, <laughs> she's hot in my book, you know? So that was first thing. And then I got to know her personality and I, man, she is so interesting and I love talking to her and getting her thoughts and ideas. And she shares those openly. And, and, and then I thought, man, she's really humble too, you know, but she's actually very driven at the same time. There's so many different things that she had going on that I thought, man, this is a really good thing. One of the things that like made it to the next level of just like, man, this girl's amazing to, hey, I should really think about maybe marrying this girl. And that was this. My, um, when, I, when I went on a mission to Argentina, you have a bunch of people that are, you know, guys and girls that are missionaries um, and they're younger, you know, we're in our early 20s, you know, so we're still figuring out life away, a lot of ways. There is a mission president. My mission president happened to be in his, in his mid 40s, 
very, very wise man. Probably one of the people that I admire and respect absolutely the most of he's got a lot of life figured out, a lot of life, a lot of wisdom. And there's a reason in our church of why he got called and why other people get called to be mission presidents because there's mission presidents all over the globe. I think there's like 350 or almost 400 different missions across the globe. And there's a mission president uh, for each one of those. And they're married and they have families and they have normal jobs and lives, but they take time and they're, they actually get called for three years to do that. And, uh, and so anyways, one of the things, and I became actually really close with him and got to spend a significant amount of time with him compared to some other people due to just some things that he asked me to do. And the thing that he said, right, when I was leaving my, my time, my two years is, uh, he gave me some counsel about marriage. And he said, that's probably one of the next big steps that you'll make. You're going to go figure out your career. You're going to go get more education, but marriage is a pretty big lifelong, like careers. You can switch careers. Wives probably shouldn't switch wives. Shouldn't, shouldn't get divorced. That's, that's not a long-term thing that you don't, you don't want to switch around a whole bunch. And he said, marry the person that you see best that would be able to take care of your kids. And if I had to say one of the most amazing attributes of my wife, it would be that she is the best nurturer and the best mother. And I could see that when we started dating that it like switched. I'm like, she would be amazing at this. And yeah, I, I want to have kids at some point. I don't know when, but, and that's when it clicked. And I was like, I remember in that little, that, that conversation that I had, she's six, almost seven years earlier popped in my mind. And I thought, oh, that's what he was talking about. And she kind of fits the bill. So I should maybe really think about this a little bit more. And I, we were just in love. And I think the biggest thing when it was all said and done, so all those little things, all these little check marks added up. And then the thing that kind of threw me over is that she was willing to, that she had the same heart and understanding and mind that I did to go, you know what? I know we're not, we don't have a lot of stuff figured out, but we'll figure it out. And I'm committed to you and we'll figure that out together to do that, you know? So that was for me of like what, what really went in uh, into that and like helped make my decision of who I wanted to marry. I'll try the, the second part of the question again. Like, do you think like you could have this kind of relationship with someone who would be more like you? Yes. Yes. But I don't, I think in, so the funny thing is, they call these people, in my opinion, and again, maybe I'm boasting of my, myself or whatever, but you know, you've heard of the term power couples, you know, they're a power couple. Like he's like, I got a friend, my best friend growing up in Oklahoma and still literally was just talking to him two days ago on the phone. His wife is a pediatrician. He's a lawyer, very, very, very good lawyer. And so they are, in my opinion, what the world would see is they're a power couple. They make good, really good money, you know, and they're a power couple. So um, that's what people would describe that. And again, I'm not going to say on his relationship. Could I go find somebody that was a little bit more like what you're saying, like me, business driven, you know, kind of kind of that very ambitious perfectionist? Yes. But for me, it's not about how much money that you make. It's not how much accolades you have or awards that you have. For me, I'm trying to figure out how to make myself whole and perfect is probably the wrong word. In fact, the Greek term for perfect means whole. It doesn't mean that you never make a mistake. It means that you're whole. And I'm tr trying to figure out how I can be more whole in my life. And my wife is the perfect complement to do that. Although most people looking at it, you know, might go, oh, you know, I'm sure people look at her and you're like, you got your, yourself an anchor of a husband there. Like, man, he doesn't even get like a lot of this nurturing stuff very well. And she goes, that's all right. He sees things that I don't see. And some people could describe her and go, oh man, but she's not like, you know, making a ton of money. She's not doing this. She's, she's not the perfectionist. She's okay. If the house is dirty now and again, you know, kind of thing. And, and that's, we get that. That's where we see things eye to eye is we're trying to help complete each other, make each other whole. So could it work with somebody else? I think it absolutely could, but I think for the long run, this is absolutely what I was looking for. Not so much to you know, have a, a power couple. Well, if you're looking to be whole yourself, do you think 
I don't know if we want to make this a little bit more general. Do you think that person can be whole on their own? Or does it need to be always someone to complete you to be whole? Oh, no, I, I, I think genuinely somebody can be whole on their own. But I say that they can become whole. And that's what I'm striving for as well, too. How do I kind of explain this concept? I'm definitely looking to become whole by myself. But if I don't have good teachers and somebody help me along the way, I don't think people can get there on their own completely. Like they're going to need good teachers. They're going to need good support systems. My wife happens to be the best support system in that aspect. And I think two, you know, I, I'm going to use two circles here. You know, some people go, oh, they're going to be whole. Like it's two whole people getting together. The way that I look at it is, no, once we become more and more whole ourselves, we become truly one in a lot of ways. And that's what I believe God wants us to be is to become one in a relationship that we can become whole together, that our wholeness as we complete each other, it helps us to individually become whole as well. May, may I ask you, how, how would you define being whole? How would I define being whole? Yes. Ooh, that's tough. Um, I think whole would, would, for me would be well-rounded and a lot of different aspects, you know, we talked about, you know, culturally, you know, living in different culture. Can you be whole without knowing all these other cultures? Yeah. And in, in some aspects, but there is some things that you need to see some other cultures and appreciate that or see that or understand it a little bit more. So yeah, I would just probably say, well, well-rounded, you know, Okay. So does it have to do something with strengths and weaknesses, like covering your weaknesses by someone else's strengths, or is it about something more? Yeah, I I think you're right. Like that's you've got some really good questions here, by the way. Uh, <laughs> that is a that is a really good question. Like, what does that mean, being whole? I, I, I agree. It's kind of like on the strength and weakness weak weakness kind of side. Like it's I don't know how else to describe that. Yeah, it's like helping each other out and their strengths and their weaknesses. Yeah, I think it is. I, I, yeah, that, that is a very deep question, Andre, because, and I realize I have not thought about that near as much as I want, specifically me for, you know, religious sake, you know, for, you know, being a believer in Jesus Christ. For me, that's what I feel like God wants us to become is to hold, to be, to eventually become whole. And we need his help to do that. But what does whole really look like? Is it just, not making mistakes or sinning, you know, like, I don't know. Uh, that's, that's where it's like, that's a really good question. I just feel like I just want to become better. I want to make less mistakes, you know, man, you need to come church with me, Andre. We can figure this out. Man. <laughs> <laughs> that's where I feel like we talk about this stuff. And I'm like, no one's ever really asked that question of like, what is that? Compl- what is that? What does whole look like truly? Like I do vision boards and I can try to imagine like what my future looks like and we set goals myself and my wife we do a retreat every single year and we do our vision boards separate vision ones and then also together what are some of our goals that we want to achieve together but man what is whole really yeah. defined and look like because you know like the vision boards and everything that that sounds like a very rational or like the a type think but to me like the, the the whole term whole seems like there has to be something more than just figuring out, you know, strengths and weaknesses and covering your bases, right? Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. It, there, it is definitely more than that. I just don't know how to describe it or define it or really even, I just don't even know all the way like right, what yeah. that all the way looks like. But I finally got you. I, I know, you got you. me. You, you got don't me. have an answer. And that is, that is definitely <laughs> what to, I love just pondering, like, so for me, I try to take 15 minutes every single day and, and write in a, a journal or a focus. In fact, I have it here at my desk. It's called Focus. And this is just a daily journal. It asks me some very specific questions for that day. How will I maintain an attitude of gratitude? Uh, what are some key win- wins that I've had recently? What are some affirmations? And then it has a, a quote and the quote changes every single day. And what it, and it just asked me, what does this quote mean to me? And then it has an, a whole nother page where I just can journal about anything. And this is one of the ones that I know is going to come up tomorrow for me of asking <laughs> what does whole look like? What does whole mean? So yeah. How does it feel like, right? Yeah. What does it feel like? Yep. Okay. Going back to the metaphor of 
the three balls that you mentioned. It seemed like you're pretty clear on the priorities, but has it ever happened to you that you either intentionally or by accident switch the priorities? Yeah, yeah, there definitely is time. I mean, I can't, I can't say, uh, you know, I can think of a time when going out with friends, you know, or a guy trip, you know, uh, going to a football game. We, a couple of years ago, you know, I had to miss out on, on my kid's soccer game for a weekend because I went out with the guys and we, we went down to Moab, Utah, and we were riding mountain bikes and doing rappelling and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, ultimately, I say those priorities switch. But that's why I talk about their their kind of balls. Like they're gonna all they're all going to get dropped. Uh, I'd love to meet the person that says like, "Oh, I never drop a ball," but all of them are gonna get dropped at some point. But for me, the glass glass one, my family, you gotta drop that the least amount of times as possible. But it's gonna happen where you drop that and you go. But I still got the wooden one and I still got the rubber one, right? I'm still juggling that. Like I still got work and I still got my friends, and so I'm juggling that. But you try to pick up that glass ball as quickly as you can and keep on juggling them all. What is your approach to cleaning up the mess when you drop, especially the glass ball? Just just my impression, again, this could be based on stereotypes and also based on your profile that you used to be a sales guy mostly. How do you go, I don't know, like if, even if you go apologize, I don't know, to your wife or to your kids? If I was looking at it, would it look like you're being vulnerable or would it look like you're being very professional and maybe even let's say salesy about admitting your mistake if you know if you know where i'm going yeah with this question. yeah are you just saying sorry because you're saying sorry because that's what is expected and that's what you're supposed to do or are you genuinely sorry and trying to make improvements you know is the way that i kind of define that yes something like that I think you can also be genuinely sorry but like your delivery could still be maybe let's say professional or maybe rehearsed in a way or it's like like really you open up in a way and i'm not sure how that looks like in your case what does it look like to clean up those mistakes i will say that's where again having a great support system so the funny thing is the really good one having a great work environment like we can talk about like personal stuff all the time and i get to get their perspective and go you know when i'm venting about like oh man i did this and then yeah my wife wasn't super happy about that, you know, and then they go, well, yeah, of course they were. She's not happy about that. What about this? And it's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe I'm just stuck in my head and I did something stupid, you know, kind of thing. My friends are really good at that. You know, we're very supportive of ourselves and how can we support? Ultimately, we all understand. I think that's when I say all my friends, particularly I think of like my really close friends, they, they get it. Your spouse comes first, no matter what you know your spouse comes first and so we're always encouraging you know spouses get mad at you know at other spouses that's just what happens but at the same time if you can help see another perspective we love talking about that not so much the vent about it but to learn like what am i not seeing here why am i not seeing like why is it a big deal because of that why are my kids blowing up at me i could just shake that off and say because they're eight and 10 years old and that's, they're just kids and they don't know any better. Or could I go, you know what, maybe there's a lesson to learn from that. Maybe they have some, some, ju you know, justification that I'm just not seeing there. That's why having a, a really good support system of good friends, a good spouse, in my opinion, because they will be able to help you see that light a little bit more clearly compared to, you know, a normal argument of just like, well, no, you're wrong and no, you're wrong. But if my wife mm -hmm. is, for the most part, not always perfect, but, you know, really good about like, hey, well, this hurt my feelings because and this is my view on it and bringing it up in a good way that we can discuss it rather than a yelling match or something like that, you know, that it could turn into. So mm -hmm. uh, how do I do that? I, I don't know. I Or how do I, you know, the, it not come off salesy? I don't know. For me, it's just trying to be genuine try to be authentic, try to be vulnerable as well too. The more I do that, the more, the better the relationships are. The more that I'm salesy or fake, the more I realize it just doesn't really pay off in the long run. It might get you the immediate answer that you want where they're like, okay, he's sorry or whatever, but they know they don't really maybe believe it all the way or yeah, 
and it just doesn't pay off. I don't know how to really describe it. It doesn't pay off because they know it's not really there. But if they genuinely believe it, it builds into this this piggy bank, you know, of, of things that they go. I know I can count on him. He's he's put into my piggy bank lots of times, you know. Is it difficult for you to admit a mistake? I would say definitely. Yep. I would definitely say that. I would definitely say that. Um, I am more quick to try to justify. My mom taught me uh, taught me this years ago, and I am only more and more now able to see it. You know, is uh, oh man, I'm forgetting the term or the the wording on it. Uh, oh, I'm gonna butcher this. This is not it, uh, but it's just not coming exactly to mind. But uh, justification is like the, the quickest way down to hell. You know, like that's what, <laughs> that's what Satan wants you to go down is like the justify mm -hmm. all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty quick at that actually. I'm like, but it makes sense because you know, this, <laughs> you know, people are like, yeah, I don't care. Like good example, you know, you don't, you don't yell at coworkers. You don't, you don't yell at employees. You know, you don't do that. They might've really screwed up and I think you could, you know, justify, but like I have the justification, you know, But no, you don't do that. You don't do that. And so for me, again, it just comes back to I really need that support system because I need people to call me out and go, nope, you're wrong. You might need to wake up a little bit. You might need to humble yourself a little bit, but you're wrong. And uh, as much as I can say like, oh, I'm, I'm totally open to being wrong. I am. But at the same time, still my mind, I have to still fight through that and go, <laughs> okay, they're saying that and they're saying I'm wrong. Am I really wrong? You know, and there's sometimes I'm not going to lie. My pride gets in the way and I'm like, right. you know what? No, I think I still think I'm right. So forget them. And I don't care if it's three people that told me that I'm wrong. I still think I'm right. But yeah, it's a, it's a pride. Pride is the downfall of, of us all. And I am not immune to that. I am definitely pride is the one thing that'll get me a lot of times. Where does that come from? Especially since you are so spiritual, I would assume that your ego isn't so huge, but I... Eh, who knows? Yeah, I don't know about that. But yeah. <laughs> um, for me, I very much believe that pride pride is probably one of the greatest sins, I guess you could say. Like some people could talk about like, oh, killing somebody or lying to somebody. Like everybody knows that's bad and that's, you know, pride is the consistent one that I think most people, and that's again, going back to my religious faith of like why I need God, because I'm going to make mistakes all the time. And I think most people have some form of, of pride. There's lots of different ways, but um, sorry, I just realized I kind of forgot your question again about why. Yeah. Like where does it come from? I think, I think it is naturally just being human. It is the natural man. It is naturally who we are whether it's certain chemicals or whatever else is going on there. I think that's how our natural person is. But I do think to become whole and complete, we have to fight against that to become better. Good example, your health. I, I, I work out five days a week. I enjoy it. It's my time that I physically get fit, but I also mentally, I feel like get th fit because I listen to good podcasts and in inspiring information good music, things like that. If, if we just didn't ever work out our, or eat well, for example, as well too, ultimately in the long run, we are not going to be better off. We're going to have a lot more problems because of that. Is it easier to sit there? Is it easier to not go to the gym? Is it easier to just have a pizza rather than go, let me cook some fresh veggies and some chicken and things like that. Yeah. It's easier, but it's not like, It's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to figure out how we can elevate ourselves, you know, and to become, going back to that word, more whole, a better version of ourselves, you know. So we're fighting against that on a daily basis. I know I am, and I think everybody is. So I'm going <laughs> to assume a few things. So correct me if I'm wrong here. Your answer was kind of like a, like a general thing. And I asked you about like the pride specifically about you, like where does your pride come from? Is it maybe relate, related to, to what you just answered? You, you see maybe humans that, that they should be striving to be better themselves and maybe you are following that path. Is that maybe where the pride comes from? Like you're doing the right thing, like you're making yourself better 
version of yourself or is it related to something different that i don't know maybe how you were brought up so i would say yes to kind of both of those i think it would be kind of what your first point was is just trying to become better that pride is there because I, i i want to become better i don't want to go back even though i know sometimes i take a step back you know in different different aspects of my life thinking about it i haven't really ever thought about this you know just cl- clicked when you said this Could it be something growing up? Um, Yeah, my dad, you know, think about it. My dad was a colonel in the military. Um, The military, I think most people think are very disciplined people. They got their, their, they got their stuff together, you know? And so I look at that and and go, yeah, I I think there probably is some things, you know, seeing my dad grow up, you know, the, and, and I think, I don't know anybody that does not think highly of my father, you know? there's a lot of regards to it. And so I think that pride of wanting to imitate that in a sense of like, I can, I can be that. I can, I can do that too. You know, I I don't look at it. There's definitely pride in the negative sense. I think there's pride in the positive sense. I am prideful of my dad. He is a a great person that treats people very, very well. Um, He's a great father, a great husband. He's a great military leader a great professional too in his careers. So I think there's pride like in that, but then there's also pride of like, oh, I don't make mistakes and everybody else gets in the way and it's everybody else's issues and, but not my issues kind of stuff. So I think wanting to imitate that probably helps me have good and bad pride in that way. You know, I want to become like that, but at the same time, I don't want to accept that I have probably a lot of more faults and failures than I'd like to recognize. One thing that I was still curious about, when you were mentioning about the support system, you mostly mentioned your friends and your wife. Would you consider your parents as a support system? Do you go talk to them about these kind of things? Or is it not something that you're comfortable discussing with them? No, 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 absolutely. I I mean, my parents, we talked, they were just here two weekends ago visiting and stayed with us. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, I talked to my parents about pretty much everything. But I do understand that they have different backgrounds and how they were raised as well too. My dad didn't, he was extremely hesitant for me starting my own company. My dad was extremely hesitant of me investing, even though for years investing in stocks and mutual funds, like, you know, be careful. My very first real job making real money, he was like, Good luck. I don't know. Like literally. So he is very encouraging in a sense, but at the same time, he's not an extrovert. He is not a risk taker in a sense. And so these things definitely play out where I have a very close relationship with them, but my, I'll never forget. I was in college. I was actually doing day trading my freshman year in college. E-trade had just barely come out e-trade well i say just barely but e-trade had come out but there was e-trade was only for rich people you know people that had thousands and thousands of dollars they had a special that went on and you if you had a thousand dollars you could start investing in e-trade long time ago okay so i did that and uh, and started day trading had a thousand bucks started day trading with that and thankfully made it into something pretty good but at the same time i called up my dad because he had been investing in in some stocks and mutual funds. And so I called him up. I'm like, dad, I, I bought this stock yesterday. It blew up. It did exactly what I was hoping it was going to do. It's more than tripled right now. And I'm like, it, it keeps on going up, but I keep on thinking like, you know, I think I need to sell and, and then just like go find another stock, you know? And he goes, no, no, no. You need to stay with that stock and keep writing it, you know, and keep, keep going. It keeps on going up. Just keep on writing it, you know? He's not the big risk person, but he's like telling me that I get off the phone with him. My mom calls me. She knew that we were on the phone. My mom calls me afterwards and says, Hey, I know you respect your dad and I very much respect him as well. I would not take his advice when it comes to stocks. And so I was like, okay. And knowing more, I knew a little bit, but I knew my dad definitely had some ups and downs when it came to investing in stocks and things like that. So I say that of 
my parents have different background and perspectives. And so that's not always going to be like, I take their advice hundred percent, but I very much talk to them about different things that are going on, getting their insights um, because they're very wise people, you know, as well too. My dad was never a business owner. My mom never, my mom was pretty much a full-time mom. She did part-time work at a bank for a while and she worked some other part-time jobs, but like career wise, you know, when it comes to like, should you do all this stuff? Like, they're, I'm going to talk to them about it because they're wise and they bring different insights. But at the same time, they're not of mentors and other people that I work with that are entrepreneurs that have made multi-million dollar companies and have made v- very successful in a sense of their companies and growing, you know? What is something that people seem to misunderstand about you? What I mean by this question is... I don't know, let's say I meet you or people meet you, they have the initial contact with you, they think that you are this way. And then once they really get to know you, they're like, oh, Kyle is actually not like that. He's completely opposite. Is that like first impression that you give that is actually not you or that, or that could be misleading? I mean, kind of like what we talked about, I think there's going to be those surface level conversations that you have that you get to know somebody. Are they really getting to know me? Probably not you know, I'm not really getting to know them very much as well either. And it's no knock. It's just, sometimes it's time. You got five minutes. How well are you going to get to know somebody in five minutes? You know, like, okay. Uh, Well, ask them, what is their definition of being whole? Yeah, exactly. Yes. (laughs) That's going to be the next one. Start with that. (laughs) Oh man. So that's tough. And maybe this goes back to maybe my pride or ego or whatever. I like to think most people probably think decently of me, you know, and I don't give So, you know, there's a book, um, Emotional Intelligence. I very much believe in that and look at people's emotional intelligence. So I'm very aware, but at the same time, I just kind of know that this is in a lot of ways who I am. There's plenty of ways to, and I've apologized to a lot of people, you know, you know, where I talk to them and maybe I said something that I'm like, oh, I was, I was just trying to be funny. And I realized that could be interpreted as maybe a little bit rude or, you know, diving in too much into the personal world, you know, without really knowing them or joking about something that they didn't think is going to be very funny or whatever, but maybe other people did. So, man, that's a, that's a tough thing. So I think I definitely look at that, but at the same time, I, I think people, I'm not trying to please everybody is what I'm trying to say. So there are probably going to be times that they're like, Hmm, I don't know if I really care for that Kyle guy. And, and that's okay. I don't want to do it because I'm not trying to make, I don't, I literally generally don't think I have any enemies for the most part. I I don't know. Hopefully not. Maybe I'm naive to that, but I think there are definitely people that are like, yeah, Kyle's not really the guy that I love to hang out with. You know, Kyle's not going to be the first person I call and that's okay. Like I'm okay with that because I think there's going to be other people that are going to say, yeah, Kyle's a guy that I definitely want to hang out with. And, you know, and do that. So I don't know, I guess just trying to not please everybody. I think some people might say that I am a people pleaser, but I generally want people to be comfortable to be who they are. That's really what I want. And does that mean that we're going to perfectly get along? No, but I want them to feel comfortable in who they are and not try to be something that they're not. Is there any, I don't know how else to call it then, tactic, how, how you're trying to make people comfortable around you? Because maybe this is, again, my first impression, and this can be, again, from my own little bubble of a maybe guy that also has ego issues, but I'm also probably very insecure. So to me, you look like the perfect guy. <laughs> and so that could, be, that could be a little bit intimidating to me. So it's like only like like when you start talking about like okay you have fear and and you struggle with things that's where I'm like okay like you're coming more down to my level like I don't see you like as the perfect guy. So so how how would you how, how do you try to make other people feel comfortable around you? I think for me it's it's vulnerability. Now I don't think I I don't I can't think of a time that I walked up to somebody and says and said Oh yeah. You know, I had to spank my kids, you know, once or whatever. Like I'm typically not walking up to people and just like laying out all my dirt of everywhere where I fail, you know, but I think being vulnerable and and letting people know, like I am not perfect. And and it's really hard because I think most people will hear that Mm -hmm. I'm not perfect, Mm -hmm. you know, and they just go, 
yeah, yeah, but you're that's what no you one's say, no yeah. one's perfect, but like you're way better than me, or he's way or she's way better than me. But I I think being vulnerable to give maybe some specifics, you know, of where maybe you you did fail, you know. Again, I look at my failures, and that's the and and that's the interesting thing for me personally. But I would probably say a lot of people have that. My biggest fear is failure. And right away, I'm being vulnerable telling you about where my failures are, you know. And again, it's not like a, hey, tell me about your failures. I think I, I think that's a like a that's a good question. You know, you could probably ask, you know, where tell me, tell me some specifics of where you're failing, you know. So there's that side to it. And then um, I think more of just relating with people, you know, when when you see realize, you know, maybe they don't feel as good in a certain aspect of their life to talk about like, man. I, my situation is definitely not the same, but I've, you know, I've yelled at my kids. I've yelled at my wife, you know, I've done this. I've done that. You can, you know, I've failed here. I made a stupid decision in work. You know, I made, you know, this decision, it cost us thousands of dollars, you know, whatever it might be. There's lots of different ways, but it's just more understanding maybe where they're at. And for me, letting them know, like I've made mistakes there, or even at the same time, just saying, look, I've made a lot of mistakes. I haven't done one in that aspect, so I wish I could relate a little bit more, but I've failed in a lot of different other ways, you know, and hopefully they know that's, again, just being more vulnerable and, and just letting them know we're all, we're all human. We're all making mistakes all the time. And that's okay. That's even though being a perfectionist, like I still say it's okay, but it's the same way that I expect with my employees and myself and the people that work at Transcend is, uh, it's okay to make mistakes, but you better learn from it and you better change. You know, if you don't, then that's probably not going to be great. Are there any situations where you feel insecure? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to think of like, uh, I think, I mean, an easy one that comes to mind that is probably not very vulnerable, honestly, because I think most people, it's like when I walk into a room and I know, you know, it could be a networking event or other CEOs and I'm like, my company's like brand new. All you guys are making way more money than I am. All you guys, like my my pitiful excuse of talking about like, you know, hiring somebody or having, thankfully I haven't had to fire anybody, but like th there's lots of different things where I'm just like, they got so much more experience and they got it all figured out. I think that's a, that's a common one that I feel like in a lot of different aspects. Going to church, there are certain people that I highly, highly regard that I'm like, oh man, but I know they're not perfect either, but I'm still like intimidated a little bit that I'm like, well, they've never, they never like, I don't know, whatever sin you want to think about. They never, they've never looked at another woman thought about that, you know, like they're married, you know, or they've never, you know, there's a lot of things on the spiritual front, the business front of going in and being with that. I mean, I get intimidated sometimes by my wife, you know, like in the sense of like, she's so much better of a nurturer than I am. And like, I just like, sometimes when I'm with my kids, I'm like, man, she has fun in a whole different other aspect that I wish I could have fun with my kids and could connect with. And I'm not as good as that. So I'm kind of intimidated by that, you know, a little bit. So yeah. So the, I think there's definitely plenty of times that I get intimidated and, but I will say it's not like I'm always airing it out in the open. Like, Hey guys, I know I'm at this networking event. I'm the new CEO. I have no clue what's going on and I'm a complete idiot. So probably just avoid me because you probably won't want to talk to me. Like I'm not airing it out like that either, you know? So I guess my final question would be, we talked about the pride and the ego and also you trying to, I don't know, figure out life. Is there something that you're trying to do with regards to your ego? Like how, how can we control it better? So you, you said, how can we control it better? You want to control my ego or you're just saying like, how in general can everybody control their egos a little bit more? Yes, yes, yes. The, 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 the second one. Okay. Ego is a little bit different than pride in my opinion. So if I had to say ego, um, I think it's going back to kind of what I said, like that vulnerability, sharing enough, but not sharing too much. Uh, you know, the, you've heard the, abbreviation TMI too much information like 
person walks in the party and they're like, hey, I got hemorrhoids. And you're like, oh, awesome. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. And I don't know if I want to hang out with that person because that just seems weird that they're sharing that much. Because obviously, I think any friendship wants discretion, you know, <laughs> like no one wants, hey, yeah, they tell about their friend and all their issues and all their problems, you know. So I think it really is just that vulnerability portion helps out quite a bit, you know. The more that you're vulnerable, the more that you're human, it helps you first off. Well, first off, I will say it helps other people understand that and see you in a different light as a human, as a real individual. But at this time, hopefully, at least I, one of the reasons why I share my vulnerability is it reminds me that I'm human um, and that I'm not perfect. I can't expect that from anybody else. And so um, it kind of helps my ego put it in check a little bit more of like, look how many mistakes you've made and how many mistakes you'll continue to make too. But that's okay. Realize that. Don't don't hold your hold your head up high enough, but not too high because you're not better than anybody else, you know. So I think vulnerability. I don't know. I'd love to get your. Now I'm going to switch the. You know, you asked the question there. <laughs> The interview is what, over. <laughs> what, what do you feel like is a way that you or that everybody are, is able to put their ego in check? You know, how, what, what helps you to do that? For me, sometimes it helps. I'm not sure if this is directly related to ego or like how my ego reacts in certain situations. Like, for example, when you were previously talking about that some of the previous employees used to upset you. I think I'm like that, like in some situation, like my immediate instant reaction is very upsetting and it might be related to my ego because I think that I would do it way better than that person did. So with that, in, in those situations, usually when I get upset, it helps to just take a step back, even sleep on it and maybe look at it again, like the next day when the ego kind of like cools off and you can look at it in a slightly different and maybe more rational perspective because like my brain would probably know that yes people are different people have different talents they have their strengths and weaknesses but in that moment it's just all ego so i guess like the time i don't know helps a little bit but i'm also like in the same boat as as you like i'm still dealing with it it's not like i uh, i'm a master of my ego but i also read a book about like the ego and how it's like the disease of the mankind like like all of us has ego issues and it doesn't always mean that when you have ego issues that you are like super confident or you're seeing yourself above others it's also the opposite way if you're feeling like you're less than others it's also ego yeah i think that's one thing universally with a lot of different religions is to be in the in the middle not too much and not too little like monks shamans uh one of our empl employees he's is hindi you know all these different religions are trying to get you to go don't be too much don't be too little be whole <laughs> be whole that, that's a nice ending to the conversation but but what i wanted to also say like to this topic is that's what i shared in one of the maybe it's something similar to to the boot camp that you went to i also went to some self-development program here in vancouver it's called landmark hmm. i'm not sure if you know about I, it i think i've heard of it i've it. never gone though but yeah and in one of the sessions i realized that that what i do or to maybe to put it in the right way, what my ego does is that I'm always competing with everyone. And as a result, I either feel better than the person or I feel worse than the person. And I'm almost never here, which is a big problem. Yeah. Hard to, it's hard to relate to people when you're here or here, but it's better. You can relate more when you're there in the middle, you know? Us, well, and it, we're talking about ego in that sense. But my hope is, again, that people feel comfortable on who they are, but also inspires them, not because of the way, like, particularly that I live, but they are just inspired to go become more and be, be more in their lives. And that can look like in many different aspects, whether that's being a better husband, father, businessman, that doesn't matter to me, but that they want to go, you know what? I can be just a little bit better tomorrow than I am today. And my hope is that that's what I 
aspire to to do you know i wish i could say i think about that every single time when i'm interacting with somebody but it's not really it's just going i hope they walk away and go man that kyle guy not that he's cool or that he's whatever but that it's like man i feel like i want to be a better version of me when i'm around them and uh that's what that's going to be my marriage advice as well too my wife definitely makes me want to be a, a better person and so I don't know. If you find one of those people, hang out with those people more, whether it's a friend or whoever, hang out with those people that want to, that help you become a better version of you. All right. Kyle, thank you very much for the interview. Yeah. Well, it was nice getting to know you. Absolutely. Same the same here. I, I say same here, Andre. Like obviously you got to ask all the questions. I'm like, man, I need to start a podcast just like to reverse that and uh, and ask you a bunch of questions. But uh yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to do this. And uh yeah, I don't know if if another time comes up that you go, hmm, let's let's look at the trans- let's talk about localization. Yeah, talk, talk actually. <laughs> let's localization. get our hands dirty. <laughs> be more than happy. Put on your A type hat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Let's stop talking about feelings and whole wholesomeness. <laughs> but, I, but ultimately, when it's all said and done, at least for me, like that's what life is about. Like life is about what we're talking about right now. Business definitely needs to be mixed in there because we have to make a living. We have to do those things. But these are the important questions in life and the important things that I think everybody's trying to figure out a little bit more. Business just happens to be a nice thing that like, yeah, let's talk about that. And yeah, who's who's going to really shame away from making more money or being a little bit more, you know, successful or feeling a little bit more success at work? No, that's I think that's OK. You know. All right. That's right. Subscribe for part two with. Kyle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, Andre, thank you All so right. much. Again, thank you. 